Well, welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today on our Graze On Over call. Um, I won't talk a whole lot, but I'm, my name is Monty Gola. I'm the Executive Director for the National Grazing Lands Coalition. And we have Jeff Hodges today. Um, I'll give a brief introduction and then I'll just turn it over to Jeff. Uh, Jeff is the Assistant Director for the National Bob White and Grassland Initiative, um, which is headquartered at Clemson University, uh, the College of Ag, Forestry and Life Sciences. His 40 plus year career includes university, state, wildlife agency, native seed industry, conservation, uh, NGO, and a self-employed conservation contractor. And now he does work with the National Bob White Conservation Initiative. Um, he works hard to promote the use of native grasslands and grazing as a wildlife management tool and manages his own native warm season forages and wildlife on his own farm in West Central Missouri. So welcome, Jeff. Thank you so much. And we are looking forward to hearing what you have to say. All right. Thank you, Monty. I appreciate that. I, uh, I'm a little bit confused of what I'm seeing here on my screen. It says my screen sharing has been paused. So I'm bear with me while I try to figure out what what's happening here. Can, okay. Uh, let me ask you, can you see my screen? Yes. Okay. All right. Let me back up now. All right. So, um, yeah, once again, uh, good afternoon, everybody. I guess maybe there's potential somebody could be morning yet, but um, thanks for joining in today. We're going to talk a little bit about uh, grazing and integrating grazing with uh, Bob White management. Um, just want to let folks know that that um, that grazing is just another tool in the toolbox. I mean, historically, we've we've at least within the wildlife community, a lot of people have not thought that grazing can be compatible with doing good conservation work. But um, we've we've no much different than that. We also have a lot of research that backs up that they can be compatible. So before I get into the the details of the grazing management. I'm going to tell you a little bit about what else we're going to talk about today. Um, let me give you a brief introduction to the National Bomb White and Grassland Initiative. I'm going to guess that that may be new to a few of you. Um, I'll give you a very basic overview of Bob White habitat requirements. I mean, we could spend weeks talking about Bob White habitat requirements. So this is going to be very, very high level. Um, and then I want to talk about why grazing can be important to uh, Bob White. And it's my opinion that it's, it's even necessary for Bob White recovery. Uh, then I'm going to review um, some of the findings that we had in a literature search that we used to put together a technical built bulletin that um, I'll mention a little bit later in the presentation. Talk about a little bit of the current research that's going on and, uh, and maybe some firsthand experiences. I also want to remind everybody that just, you know, keep in mind that the things that I'm telling you today are our best recommendations based upon the information we have available at the time. There is very little research related to grazing management for Bob Whites. There's quite a bit out there for a number of other bird species, but not so much for Bob Whites. Um, so a lot of times when we review the literature, we have to look at, at these other species, and then we have to make some inferences based upon uh, what that research has told us about those other species and how the habitat requirements compare. So what is the MBGI? Again, I've got this annoying um, thing on my screen that says I'm not sharing. So I want to confirm yeah. that. Jeff, I think you might want to stop screen share and start again because we okay. see your slides, but it's not in presentation mode. Okay. Let's do that. Now. It's loading. Right. There we go. Perfect. Okay. Well, I'm glad I didn't have anything really uh, exciting in the image that we were worried about. So anyway, a little bit about what the National Bob White and Grassland Initiative is. Um, biologists from 25 different state agencies that make up the core of Bob White range um, they make up a technical committee and they those biologists participated in the development of this recovery strategy that you see uh, outlined here on the screen. And the very first iteration of that recovery strategy was published in 2002. 
It's gone through an update in 2011, and we are uh, due for another update. Um, and hopefully we'll get to that sometime soon. I'm going backwards. Now, who is MBGI? Uh, literally and technically, MBGI is the plan that I just referenced. But those initials have become to be synonymous with the technical committee that supports the plan and uh, the staff of which I'm part of uh, that's charged in helping to deliver the plan. In our role, our staff role is to lead, leverage, and enable the state wildlife agencies to implement that strategy. We do that through a variety of ways, some technical assistance, um, doing uh, webinars and, and uh, podcasts and video recordings of things to help um, folks out and the technical assistance. We also are very active um, in politics and in rulemaking uh, with some of the federal agencies. So um, we're involved um, in a lot of those different things um, to help this lead, leverage, and enable. A little bit of context about today's presentation, because I, you know, I'm guessing there may be some folks that are outside of the area that I'm primarily referring to. Um, and when I say that, um, you know, I'm looking at that West Texas, Eastern New Mexico, Eastern Colorado, Western Kansas, those areas, those are, those are within Bob White range. But what I'm going to be talking about today and grazing management will apply to the Eastern part of the United States, which on average receives greater than 30 inches of average annual rainfall. Now, some of the principles or things I'll talk about. Uh, don't specifically apply in the Western United States just because of the rainfall. Um, but there are some some basics that will apply. I'll try to highlight those when we talk about them. Um, the other thing is I'm going to be talking about native warm season forages for the most part in a complementary grazing system uh, because cool season forages dominate in the Eastern United States. Um, and the reason I'm talking about native warm season forages is just simply because the management style for the cool season forages aren't extremely cat compatible with Bob White's. There may be some potential for nesting in very rare instances, maybe some brood rearing, but uh, cool season forages are they're just the growth habit and the way they're managed typically does not provide good bobwhite habitat. Now, there are other grass bur grassland bird species that do respond to those, but uh, not particularly bobwhites. And then uh, third, and I already touched this, the eastern United States, greater than 30 inches uh, of rainfall area. So, um, and also I'm talking about Bob Whites, uh, none of the Western quail species. If we get into Texas and New Mexico, we could be talking about scale quail or gambles, merns, some other species um, that that aren't going to be covered in today. So I'm going to talk, start getting in a little bit about the, this Bob White overview. And regardless of location, whether you're in 12 inches of rainfall or whether you're in 80 inches of rainfall, the structure um, is the key component to Bob White habitat. The National Bob White Grassland Initiative broadly defines it by these three general categorizations here. The herbaceous or the grassy cover is greater than eight inches, greater than 50% of the year. Um, so back to the cool season, warm native warm season um, comparison, if you're optimizing your cool season forage management, you're probably not operating in that eight inch greater than eight inch greater than 50% of the year range. That's just, if you're optimizing your, and you're doing good job of grazing your cool season forages, um, you're just not going to be there much of the year. So that's one of the reasons that cool season forages don't, um, don't provide the best uh, quail habitat available. 25 to 75% bare ground. Again, that sounds pretty drastic um, and that 75 percent bare ground would probably apply more to the western range and the lower rainfall regions uh, we certainly don't want to see 75 percent bare ground in the eastern united states in fact i I'd, I'd argue that you probably it's probably impossible to achieve that without some sort of mechanical disturbance um, the other thing that a lot of people maybe get a little bit 
confused about when we talk about bobwhite habitat and bare ground is is we're really talking about the space between the grass plants down on the ground so that there's you know there's there's coverage uh, there's vegetative coverage it's just the space in between the plants and we can also include in there some sort of light litter layer that um this light litter layer would be real tight to the ground and and so really the way to think about it is to think about the mobility of those quail chicks those quail chicks are born they're barely the size of your thumb um and just think of them in terms of a ping pong ball and then when you look at that grassy cover and and trying to analyze the bare ground how easy would it be for a ping pong ball to ro be rolled through there without getting hung up in the vegetation so that's how we want to kind of look at bare ground is how easy those quail chicks could get around and the third one and i think this is a critical one that we miss in a lot of circumstances is this protective cover um, a lot of times we also refer to that as shrubby cover uh, these would be woody or stiff stem plants that are uh, less than 12 feet tall. In a lot of cases, if we're talking in rangeland, you know, we're talking about um, skunk bush or plum thickets, plum thickets that get a little bit taller, um, even shinnery oak. Um, but uh, th they're available year round. Um, and this 50 meters to protective to and from protective cover, that's that's the lacking part in a lot of situations. Um, and if you're like me, I don't deal with metrics very often. So a, a conversion or a good comparison of that would be roughly the width of a football field. Um, the football field is a, is a little less than that, but it, it it's about that just to give you some sort of visual idea of the 15 meter to protective cover. Now I understand in a pasture situation, there's a lot of producers that aren't going to be very, um, uh, very well tuned in to doing, um, you know, shrub mots 50 meters apart within their pasture. And, and I'll address that a little bit later in how we might want to take a look at dealing with that. So now why would MBGI, why would a Bob White organization be interested in grazing? You know, I've touched on that a little bit, but I want to get into a little bit more here. Um, in that greater than 30 inch rainfall region without some sort of regular disturbance these native warm season grasses just they become too thick for bob white again go back to my example of the ping pong ball and an ability to get through there if there's not some sort of disturbance in those native grasses that litter layer becomes thick um they their insect production goes down uh, which are insects are important for the brood rearing uh, food source for broods so it it's really they become too thick without some disturbance well grazing provides that necessary disturbance and the other unique thing about grazing is that there's a lot of structural heterogeneity out there there's a lot of differences in the height of the vegetation even in this image you can see some of those grasses are taller than others and there's some there's some spaces in between the clumps. There's a lot of diversity in the structure, both in the in the height and, and the size of it, distribution of it. And grazing creates that for us um, that we really can't get with any other means. Or if we do through some other means, it's, it's a fairly temporary approach. I mean, prescribed burning provides um, some disturbance. We can do disking and provide disturbance, but they're generally fairly short-lived. Um, so that... Um, grazing becomes a really helpful tool when we're dealing with native warm season grasses and i think probably the most important part of that is it provides a win-win situation for the landowners it is um there's a lot of economics out there that if you incorporate native warm season forages into a grazing system a complementary grazing system with cool season forages that can improve your bottom line and it does a lot of other um, very beneficial things for the overall grazing system on your farm and, and more of that holistic approach. Um, so, you know, that's really the appeal to the National Bob White Grassland Initiative in promoting grazing for Bob White management is that it can be a win-win situation for landowners. And the other important thing is, is that it's potentially a matter of scale. Uh, one of the issues with Bob White is the the habitat um, fragmentation that we see out there. And 
the challenge we have is affecting enough acres on a landscape level to have some sort of impact on Bob White. We've proven over and over again, you can impact a local Bob White population, but to have an impact on, on the population as a whole, uh, we're just not operating at a big enough scale to make that happen. So when we look at this pie chart, we look at the land use in the eastern United States, and I'll have to admit, I don't know exactly what's defined here geographically in the eastern United States. These are USDA numbers and classified as pasture and hay, but I can tell you that by definition, by USDA definition, it probably fairly closely aligns with that map that we showed earlier and the 30-inch rainfall line, with the exception of, of some of the um, pastures on the west coast. Um, where there's uh, adequate rainfall out there, um, then they do have pasture. The orange and the red indicate the CRP practices, CP1 and CP2, which are both grass-based practices and historically represent the grassland conservation effort that's on the landscape. And those two practices combined are just a little over a million acres compared to those Eastern US pasture acres of 64 million acres. Um, so it's it's a matter of, of the scale that we're working at and what kind of impact we can have. And that landscape scale impact is important. And that's what I mentioned there just a couple of minutes ago. Um, so this chart, this graph shows the potential scale of the habitat impact. So if we've got 64 million acres of pasture and we can convert just 10% of that cool season pasture to a native warm season forage, we're looking at 6.4 million acres on the landscape. Now we're starting to have a landscape impact. Now, one of the things that I, I do want to uh, bring up here, at, you know, 6.4 million acres is significant, but in a well-balanced cool season, warm season complementary system, most recommendations are to have anywhere from 25 to 30 percent in those native warm season forages um, so you can optimize the, the, the financial um, gain from those native warm season forages. So if you look at that and look at that 25 to 30 percent of those 64 million acres, then we're looking at at 25%, we're at 16 million acres, and at 30%, we're almost 20 million acres. That's when we start really having a landscape scale impact. And I think at that point in time, um, I mean, I would I would be absolutely flabbergasted if I didn't see some sort of response in Bob White population if we were able to impact that kind of a landscape. And I put those CP1 and CP2 numbers on there just for comparison that um, the CRP again is kind of hailed as, as the best grassland, grassland bird conservation opportunity out there. But if we could get a working land situation, how many more acres could we impact than, than the CRP? I'm gonna talk a little bit about the Bob White response to grazing and pardon me for a moment, I'm gonna grab a drink. And these two images are, are the same location, two different years apart. This is from a study that's being conducted in, in um, southwest Missouri. And if you look at the upper left-hand corner of the image on the left side, um, and, and if you notice the dots on there, and those dots may be kind of hard to see, but those dots represent quail locations that have been tracked by GPS um, radio tags that they mount on their back. Um, so each one of those dots represents a quail location over time. And you can see that in that uh, upper left-hand corner of the image on the left, there is just pretty much void of any Bob White locations. There are some around the edges, but there's absolutely nothing out in the middle. Now I wanna look at the picture on the right and look at that same portion of the field and look at all the dots there. Okay, this is a year later. So the difference between those two, and if you've read the slide, you can already tell what the difference is, is in 2014, that pasture was not being grazed and it had not been burned for two years. So it had basically set idle for two years. The quail were essentially avoiding that. And then when they come back in the following year and introduce grazing, 
not burning, but just grazing into that pasture, look at all of the quail locations that are in there. So this is a very uh, vivid example of how bobwhite respond to grazing. Some of the other interesting data that came out of this particular study was that in those grazed pastures, Bob White initiated their quail nest earlier. They, uh, they laid more eggs and they also, their nest survival was greater within those grazed pastures compared to areas that had not been grazed or burned. Um, so this illustrates <clears throat> that uh, Bob White and grazing can be very compatible. Um, and it's one of the reasons we're hopeful that we can have some sort of an impact um, through grazing as a bobwhite management tool. Get into some, you know, not too detailed, but a little bit of information about the individual uh, approaches to uh, grazing management for bobwhites in the different types of stocking systems. And for the purposes of this discussion, I've, I've really separated stocking into three main categories and there's um, at least beyond the continuous stocking when we talk about simple rotational and intensive rotational there's a variety there's a number of different methods within that but they all fall under that particular category so in continuous stocking again i'm looking at a, a complementary system so actually in reality it's it is a rotational system we're grazing cool season in the spring warm season in the summer and cool season in the fall so it, you know when you look at the year round approach it is a um, rotational system very simple rotational system but when i'm talking about continuous stocking in this context what i'm talking about is during that grazing season now, it's going to vary depending upon where you're located north to south, uh, but generally speaking, we would be looking at grazing, um, initiating grazing sometime in May and generally um, uh, ceasing grazing sometime around the first or the middle of September. Um, again, variability depending upon where you are north to south. And really, our trigger for that uh, should be our vegetation height. Um, we would like to see vegetation at about um, 15 inches or more um, before we initiate grazing on these native grasses. So under a continuous stocking, um, we will set that stocking rate to achieve that 14 to 24 inch canopy height. That's where we want to maintain it. Once they get above 24 inches, they're typically, they lose forage value. They get, um, they get a little bit stemmy, a little bit mature. Um, so their value is not quite so good. Once they get below 14 inches, again, you're into a stemmy, uh, low value forage. But more importantly, when you get below 14 inches, you start to implant, impact the, the plant vigor, the grass vigor, um, by reducing the uh, leaf surface area that's available for photosynthesis. And, um, and you want to avoid doing that just like you would with your cool season forages you don't want to overgraze them you need those leaves out there to be those solar cells that are um, converting the sunlight to energy so that stocking rate it, it's really difficult for me to say that uh, well that's one animal unit um, per acre or per five acres or whatever it is because it 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 depends on your site conditions and, and how fast you're or how good your soil is, what kind of forage you have. Um, so there's a lot of difference there in site productivity. And, and part of that will also depend on what, what kind of animals you're using to graze it. Are you doing stalkers? Are you doing cow-calf pears? Or, you know, what you're using it. So there'll be some experimentation involved there. Um, one of the things that you probably observe with the continuous um stocking approach um, is you know you do have some heavy use areas so if you have the ability to maybe move the water around or move mineral to different locations to kind of reduce the pressure on some of those heavy use areas that'd be helpful but um, on the other side of that coin some of that bare ground I mean literally bare ground is very useful for Bob White because they do a lot of dusting for um, to help control the uh, parasites and different things that that uh, uh, create problems for them. So most everybody that I've talked to that use native forages in a grazing system, um, and they talk about optimizing their income off of that and their animal performance 
they're stocking somewhere in the neighborhood of one animal per two acres. And again, that's this is through the Midwest, Mid-South. It, it might be different in, in other locations. Um, but that's kind of a ballpark figure. Um, some of that you run the math on some of the, the stuff out there and it's it's one and a half to to two and a half acres per animal. So um, but what we found is also stocking at that at that um, stocking rate or stocking density, in this case, it'd be stocking rate. It's fairly easy to maintain that 14 and 24 inch canopy height. That's about um, it's about where those animals uh, tend to keep that grass. So this seems to be really compatible in that um, sense. Um, and as you're aware, continuous stocking is a very easy system to to implement. Uh, not a, not any major infrastructure involved. Typically, you only need one water source, although multiple sources would be helpful um, in order to move some of that heavy use area pressure around. So I want to talk about simple rotational stocking. And there's I, I'm going to present three different options here. You know, you're all aware, you know, just a simple rotational stocking where you uh, might have a pasture divided into two or four uh, paddocks and, and they graze in a particular paddock for a while and then you move them on to the next one. Um, so some of the challenges from the forage management side here um, in, in dealing with um, grazing cattle through this is that, you know, in the springtime, these native forages, native grasses are growing a lot quicker than they are later in the year. Um, so to maintain that 14 to 24 inch canopy height, you're going to have to rotate through those paddocks a lot quicker. Um, so you're going to go faster uh, earlier in the year, and then you're going to slow down later in the year. Um, you just have to adjust that based upon the grass growth that's going on. So in general, though, if you're not um, exceeding um, a stocking density of, of two, and this is based upon what we found in the literature, and, it, and we can't pin it down exactly, but somewhere around two animals and i'm saying animals not animal units two animals so if you're talking about a cow calf pair that's two animals um around two animals per acre um is where we have a very low probability of any kind of nest destruction uh whether it's through trampling or through uh abandonment created by grazing around the nest and and uh scaring the the hen off of the nest, or in some cases, removing enough vegetation around the nest that it makes the nest easier for predator to find. But again, if we're maintaining that 14 to 24 inch canopy height, um, those don't become an issue. Um, and the probability of, of trampling is fairly low at that stocking density. So another couple of options on this simple rotational stocking, um, because there may be concerns uh, about nest trampling or some other issue with nest abandonment that you could set aside one of those paddocks uh, and just don't graze it that season. Um, then the strategy would be the following year is you would graze that one and you would set aside a different one. And you would, uh, over the period of however many paddocks you have, that number of years, you would rotate your uh, initial um, starting paddock to a different paddock or your set aside paddock to a different paddock. Um, the other one um, is to um, establish a last to be grazed paddock, which is basically the same as a set aside, but without just totally not grazing it, you would graze it, but you would graze it late in the season. Again, an animal performance side of that, there are some issues. You're not going to be able to maximize animal performance doing that because by the time you uh, save that paddock until late in the season, the forage quality is going to drop and you're going to see a, a decline in weight gain. So that might not be the best approach if you're uh, dealing with stalkers. However, with cow-calf pairs, it probably work just fine. And again, the key, uh, one of the keys to this is initiating grazing in a different paddock each year um, and, and change those um, each, each year, just so you're creating that variety of structures out there. So intensive rotational stocking, um, and I know this is this is a really popular, you know, one form or another of this right now is is really popular, and there's a lot of a um, lot of really good benefits to this. 
But we have some real questions when it comes to Bob White's. Um, and really, our biggest question is, um, because of stocking density, the probability of nest destruction in the paddock during the grazing bout is is really high. The, the probability of nest destruction is really high during that grazing bout. Um, so that any nest that would happen to be in that has a very high probability of being destroyed. Well, the other problem is, is maybe one of the paddocks way down the line is attractive for nesting and they establish a nest there, but the, the uh, grazing bout ends up, uh, the rotation gets there before the nest is completed. Um, so there's, there's some concern here about whether that really works very well or not. One of the things that we do recommend is to um, perhaps set aside an ungrazed or a set aside paddock and just just leave that ungrazed. Uh, that way you have something undisturbed to the season. Um, and kind of like with the um, with the simple rotational and leaving a last to be grazed paddock, um, that could potentially work too. But one of the issues we deal with with Bob White's is they have a very, very long uh, nesting cycle. Uh, number one, I mean, it could be as long as 55 days from nest location, initiation, nest building, um, egg laying, incubation, the whole process. It could be as much as, as 55 days. Um, leaving a paddock ungrazed for 55 days during a native warm season grass during that growing season is really going to impact forage quality. Um, so it, it might not be too desirable um, to go that route. The other thing is, is quail will initiate a nest anywhere from, from May to September. Um, and again, depending upon your latitude, maybe even earlier or later than that in some of the warmer climates they could even initiate nests earlier than that so um, there's really no good formula for avoiding nesting in this intensive rotational stocking now i will also have to admit <clears throat> and i think i'll yeah we we'll cover that in this next slide we really don't know um, what the best paddock size is the only recommendation we can make is that the larger the better um, and I don't want to discourage anyone from using um, an intensive rotational grazing system. Uh, if they're warning for Bob White, I, I just would let you know that you're probably not going to optimize your opportunity for Bob White under that type of a system. And there's always opportunity to have areas outside of your grazing system that you could have available for nesting. Now, one of the things that we, we do see can happen in these intensive uh, rotational grazings is that um, some of these paddocks, after they've been grazed and had uh, some time to recover, do provide some really good brood habitat. Um, so there were definitely some opportunities there. And I'm not saying um, we can't do intensive rotational grazing and manage for quail. I just want to temper your expectations uh, and let you know that it, it, you're probably not going to optimize your quail. Um, but again, if we're looking at getting uh, 19 million acres on the landscape, if there's a few acres of this, um, it's going to be better than what we got in terms of bomb white habitat. So uh, it would represent a net increase in habitat. So I want to talk about, we talked a little bit about this protective cover, and I wanted to take a look at this hypothetical pasture example. Um, and this, uh, in the way I'm just showing in here, is just a simple complementary system, the green representing the cool season forages and the the kind of peach colored representing the native warm season forages. Um, so one way to address this protective cover rather than having it within your pasture is to uh, provide it at the pasture margins. It may not optimize the habitat value when we think about those 50 meter uh, distances between uh, or to and from, but again, having some of this on the landscape uh, is a much better situation than not having any at all. So I want to summarize um, what we've been talking about. And basically, good native warm season forage management is Bob White nesting habitat. When we talk about maintaining those canopy heights greater than 14 inches, and again, that's for plant vigor as much as anything else. It's also for animal performance, but that provides us Bob White habitat. 
Um, so in this case, when we're managing uh, native grasses correctly, um, bobwhite habitat becomes a byproduct of the process. What we found looking through the literature is that stocking density and forage utilization, utilization are really more important drivers of habitat quality, not so much the grazing system. Um, the possible exception might be that intensive rotational, but uh, overall that stocking density and forage utilization are uh, the more important drivers. And we have seen that stocking densities above two head per acre, <clears throat> excuse me, may have an impact on nesting. I'm aware of uh, some studies that were done in, in Tennessee and Kentucky where they were above that. They were in the neighborhood of four uh, head per acre and did not note a significant um, um, impact on nesting. Um, in some cases, it was somewhere around 4% uh, nest um, destruction. Um, so that's fairly low. It's not considered to be significant. One of the things that we hear about all the time, particularly uh, if you have CRP um, in grass and you're doing any kind of mid-contract management or we get into an emergency haying and grazing situation, um, <clears throat> that in a lot of situations that grazing during the primary nesting season are, are not compatible. And also that continuous stocking, we hear that all the time, continuous stocking is not compatible with nesting bob whites. And what we have found with the appropriate stocking density and forage utilization, maintaining those can canopy heights, they are very compatible. Um, so there's no reason to avoid grazing during this primary nesting season, as long as we're at that proper stocking density and forage utilization. A lot of the literature you read out there recommends uh, postponing uh, grazing native forages, if, you're, if you have bird considerations, postponing them <clears throat> until the 1st of July, um, not haying until after the 15th of July or, or something along that line, which from the bird perspective is fine. But from a producer perspective, if you're trying to optimize your animal performance and get the most out of your forage, that you that's the worst time of the year not to be grazing those grasses. You should be on those grasses in May and June um, when they're providing you the most benefit you can get. So um, this is one of the challenges we have um, have among the wildlife profession is convincing those people that aren't strong supporters of grazing that it's okay to graze during that primary nesting season as long as you follow that stocking density and forage utilization. <clears throat> and we talked about this quite a bit. The potential for landscape level impact is huge. Um, you know, when we, I mean, even at 10%, 6.4 million acres, that's almost, uh, I mean, that's still six times greater than what the CRP program is providing. Um, now, some things that I didn't talk about are optimizing bobwhite response. So there's some landscape context um, issues of, uh, that have to do with how close um, <clears throat> these habitat, excuse me, and how close these habitat patches are to each other. So what I can say there is the closer they are to each other, the better. So if you're in grazing native forages on your farm uh, and you got a neighbor doing it or a neighbor, you know, a couple of houses down, they're doing it. That's great. If you're grazing them on your farm and no one else in the county is doing it, that's not so good <clears throat> in terms of the landscape context. But still, even small patches can can be beneficial. Um, so that does illustrate the need to cluster practices. And there's also some predation issues that I didn't get into because that's really not what we're here to talk about today. So anyway, I want to point out that it, everything I talk about today is in this technical bulletin called Beef, Grass, and Bob White's Quail Management in Eastern Native Warm Season Grass Pastures. Um, and that's available online at mbgi.org. Um, and you can, uh, you'll have to do a little search in there to get to a page where you can download it. But uh, all of this information is in there. Um, and I guess that wraps up what I have to talk about today. I don't know if we've got time for questions, but um, I'd be happy to answer any if I can. We absolutely have time for questions, um, please.
Um, Ellen said, we had a question from social media that I want to make sure gets asked. Do you know how this will affect the new BLM lease slash permittee proposed change? Yeah, I have no idea. First, I don't know what the uh, lease permittee proposed change is. Um, and then also because of the context of what we were talking about today being in the eastern United States, um, I don't think there are any BLM lands um, other than perhaps a m monument or two that would be in the eastern United States. Okay. Do we have other questions from the audience? Now's your chance. Does anyone who have goats do any of your work? I don't know the details of it. I do know that there are some people um, that raise goats and uh, graze these native forages, but I really can't tell you any of the details about it. Uh, what I can say is um, that if we go back and we look at the structural requirements for Bob Whites, regardless of what animal you're using to graze, if you're meeting those structural requirements, you will be providing uh, habitat for Bob Whites and a number of other uh, grassland bird species that respond to the same habitat um, requirements. So we had a couple of other questions coming in on the chat. Uh, Mark Brown asks, with an abundance of invasive old world blue stems, can you create good quail habitat? <clears throat> yeah, that's a tough one. I, I don't have a lot of firsthand experience with the old world blue stems. I, I mean, I do understand they're a, a problem with invasive, um, but I don't have any experience grazing them. So I don't know if there is a grazing management approach. Um, that would allow you to create that structure that we're talking about. Um, so I, I apologize. I don't have enough information on that to really answer that question. Um, yeah, I'm just trying to think about what I'm familiar with. <clears throat> I mean, I there may be a way to to create some of the structural characteristics. Um, but I, I just, I don't know enough about it. Sorry. Okay. Fair enough. We, uh, we don't deal too much with old world blue stems in the Eastern United States. Um, most of that, uh, I mean, there is, there's a little bit of that. Uh, there's some Caucasian and, um, that's used, but, um, yeah, just don't deal with it very much. Uh, Jim Shelton has a question. Are there incentives or cost share opportunities available for grasslands in Northeast Oklahoma? I don't know specifically, but I can tell you that the Natural Resources Conservation Service has um, cost share uh, programs available for um, doing um, pasture management for doing conversions if you have a cool season or even if you have an introduced warm season that you want to convert to a native warm season there are programs available depending upon the program it could be a competitive offer you'll have to make a you'll have to put a plan together um, make an offer and it will go through a ranking process and then if it if it meets the ranking criteria you'll be offered a contract to do that work. Uh, every state operates a little bit differently. I don't know the state. Uh, the other place I would look would be the state wildlife agency uh, and see if they have any programs. Uh, I can tell you right now, though, with the huge influx of money coming into the Natural Resources Conservation Service uh, through the Inflation Reduction Act, that... Um, Pasture and rangeland planting is one of the approved practices, um, so there is likely to be a, a great opportunity uh, to take advantage of some of those uh, that, that technical assistance and those cost share programs to apply those practices on your property. 
Um, Bob Hendershot asks, how successful have you been in allowing grazing during the primary nesting season with USDA programs? Not, <laughs> to be honest. Uh, we're, that's part of the, uh, you know, I'd mentioned early on about our um, uh, efforts in the policy arena, and, and that's an area that we've been working on for two or three years, trying to get some allowances there. Um, and we just we're we're having trouble getting that done. I will tell you though that uh, let's see, it's I guess it was in the eighteen farm bill. Uh, we were able to get uh, grazing allowed as a mid contract management practice. Uh, the landowner would have to forego any kind of uh, cost share assistance payment. Normal mid contract management would allow had a cost share with it, but grazing uh, they would not allow that. So. Uh, we, we are making some headway, but we just haven't gotten to the point to where um, they're going to allow that yet. Um, I think we're headed there. I think we've got good evidence. We've got good science behind it. Um, it's just a, a matter of, of changing uh, the um, <laughs> the cultural bias or the institutional bias that we seem to be dealing with as much as anything. Uh, see, Jim Shelton has a follow-up question. Can these practices be utilized on smaller acreages, say three to five hundred, uh, three to six hundred acres, to restore quail populations? Um, that, that's a little bit of a loaded question. Uh, it, it, the practices definitely can be used um, and applied to any size acreage. Um, regardless. Now, whether there's going to be a quail response or not is um, the real question. And I guess that's what I was referring to when I said that's a loaded question. It really depends on your landscape context. If there are Bob White within your neighborhood, and, and I'll say within 10 miles, the chances of immigration into an area are uh, better than if there are no Bob White within 10 miles. Re better off if they were within three miles, the chances of immigration would be much better. It, the further you get away from a, another Bob White population, the lower the likelihood of immigration uh, into an area. Now, if you have Bob White on your property um, and you do these habitat improvements, you will definitely see an an impact on the numbers. Um, what you're going to determine as recovery, is, you know, that's going to be by your definition. So I, I couldn't say that. But without your five to 300 to five to 600 acres and a whole bunch of other people's, when we talk about Bob White as, as a population as a whole range wide, uh, we've got to have all of those others out there to see. Uh, a population recovery. Um, so we can have an impact on local populations, but it, it, without that landscape scale that I was talking about, the, you know, 16 to 19 million acres, um, the probability of a, of a range wide recovery is, is pretty small. Um, Jim's got another question. What's the importance of a balanced mix of weeds, forbs, and grasses in managing and maintaining quail populations? Well, the, it, it's important. Forbs <clears throat> are important for uh, several different reasons, but they, they tend to attract more insects um, than the grasses do. Um, they create the, the biodiversity. So you have different levels of energy that are available through the seed sources uh, that they also produce. In general, the grasses don't produce much in the way of, of food through their seed. Um, I mean, Bob White will ingest them as part of the process of picking up where other, ever other food sources there are. But typically those grass seeds, unless they're annuals, are fairly low value, energy value. So the forbs become important because they do have higher value foods and they are also uh, good substrates for insects, which are important um, for that. Um, you know, and one of the things that that we um, 
that we talk about incorporating into these are, are, are Forbes, um, but we also know there's a lot of situations where uh, people are spraying pastures because they have, quote unquote, weeds in their pasture, and they're looking for that um, that real nice monoculture look out there. And all of that may be aesthetically pleasing. We're finding, with the exception of invasive species, that really does little value for improving the forage quality of what's out there. And we're also finding that a majority of those uh, forbs and quote unquote weeds are providing a, a fairly significant uh, value to the forage base. Um, I, I always kind of liken it to a salad bar. You know, you can go to the, and I'm not picking anybody in particular, but you go to a little local restaurant and, and they might have lettuce and, and maybe four or five other containers of, of, carrots and cucumbers and peppers or whatever else to put on it well then you go to a, another uh, restaurant that has three or four different kinds of lettuce and has um, 40 different containers of all of the things that are you would put on a salad and it's like well which would you rather have would you rather have the the option with just a handful of choices or would you rather have the option with 50 choices when you're looking at what to eat so having that biodiversity out there, I think it's really important. And um, a lot of the people I've talked with also talk about the animal health issues. Uh, they don't deal with as many animal health issues when they have a good diverse planting um, as um, when they have a, a uh, just a single monoculture. Do we have any other questions? Well, Jeff, I really appreciate you taking the time today. And as always, it almost lasts always an hour. <laughs> so we always manage to fill the time. Um, but I really do appreciate you taking the time and come and educating us all on this. And Ellen's right. We do have a lot of people that will view this little webinar on, on the internet uh, once, it's, once it's uploaded. So I'm sure we'll get a lot more views. People usually will register and then um, we'll realize they missed it and then they will they will come and they'll find it. So I do appreciate it. Um, one thing I wanted to let everybody know, don't forget about our uh, the Vermont bus tour, September the 5th, 6th and 7th of this year. It's gonna be in and around the Burlington, Vermont area. And if you watch, you will see uh, around uh, Earth Day, there is a code that will be put out on the internet um, for a discount registration. So be on the look for that. It's only good for use on Earth Day, which should be Saturday, I think the 22nd. So um, does anybody have any other things they would like to add, Rob or Ellen? Um, just thank you, Jeff. Great job. Great presentation. Learned a lot as always, as everyone does from you. So thank you for sharing with us today. Well, thank you, Rob. I appreciate the opportunity. And, um, you know, I think it's really important to get this grazing message out. Um, <clears throat> I think a lot of producers, um, you know, when they understand that they can have a role in Bob White recovery, um, might get a little bit excited about Bob White again. And then I also, um, you know, we're trying to sell this message to some of the people within the conservation world as well um, that just haven't uh, accepted the fact that grazing is an important part of the ecosystem that we're uh, inherited. And, um, you know, we we got to do it. We got to do it if we're going to make the most of, of what we've been given to work with. So. I appreciate everybody's attention today. My contact information is there on the screen. Feel free to reach out and uh, happy to follow up with anyone if you have any questions afterward. So thank you very much. Thank you, Jeff, once again. All right, everyone have a wonderful, wonderful day. Bye, everyone.